Here we go. It's a big gun right there. Oh, I like to flex every once in a while on this show. Anyway, today's episode is super fun, and we have a giveaway for you right now. Real quick, before I get to the giveaway, patience, everybody. Calm down. I'm going to give the giveaway away, but just hold on one second. Okay, look. In these episodes, we answer people's questions. You may be wondering where we get these questions from. If you want us to answer one of your fitness questions on air and shout you out, go to the Instagram page, Mind Pump Media. So go to Mind Pump Media, go under the Qua meme, post your question. If we like it, we'll answer it on one of our shows. All right, what's the giveaway? Well, the giveaway today is MAPS Split. This is the most bodybuilder-ish program that we have. Yes, it's bodybuilder-ish. It's strictly for bodybuilding. So if you like to sculpt and shape and build your body, you like to look good in Speedos on stage with an oiled up body yes. like Adam. Adam used to compete in men's bikini. A lot of you guys don't know this, but that's what he did. Map Split is the program, and we'll give it to you for free if you do the following. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on your notifications. And if we pick your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to Map Split. Isn't that awesome? One more thing. We are running a huge sale this month. Maps Anywhere is 50% off, and the Fit Mom Bundle, which includes Maps Anywhere, Maps Hit, Maps Anabolic, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide, is also 50% off. By the way, you don't have to be a Fit Mom to get the Fit Mom Bundle. All those programs are great for guys, too, dads, too, and everybody else. So you can also get that bundle, get the 50% off, or get Maps Anywhere, get 50% off by doing the following. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code NOVEMBER50, NOVEMBER50 for that discount. All right, here comes the show. Hey, I want to start out this uh, this episode by talking about the pump and how sometimes it's overrated. <laughs> sometimes really? it's okay, overrated. so we just highlighted it. I know, we just did a whole episode. Now oh, we got to bring it down a notch. Yeah. No, you know, the, the, the pump has got value. We've talked about it in a previous episode. However, there are times when the pump is not what you're seeking, and that's okay because the types of workouts that don't necessarily provide or produce the best pump can sometimes also be extremely productive in terms of giving you great results. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, this morning I did a old school five by five workout. That's not yes. going to give me a pump like supersets or you know sets of twelve or squeezing and stretching and all that stuff. I'm not doing many isolation movements. You know, it's like bench press, row, overhead <clears throat> press, that kind of stuff. But uh, lots of value. You know, when I do those kind of workouts at the right time, I get, I build muscle, I get stronger. So it's important to talk about that because I think you can go in one direction, fall in love with it and forget that there's value. Are there the other, other examples like where you were obviously athletic performance, it is not ideal to get a yeah, pump, No, but what yeah. else? Like what? powerlifting. You don't really care, right? The goal is to, you don't to care. get stronger. I, you don't care, but does it really hinder you much? It doesn't hinder you. Not like athletic performance. Oh, I right? hear what you're saying. Yeah. When like where, where does it hinders you? Right. Yeah. Where, where is the, where is the, the, the pump, uh, you know, not good for training. Oh, well that's athletic different. performance. It would have to be that. But I can't think of another time where it would be a problem, right? That's the only thing that comes to mind. You're trying to look smaller. <laughs> <laughs> said nobody. I know. Man, I, got, I said nobody I at all. I can't fit in this outfit. No, that's true. I've actually trained athletes. I never forget my very first client ever told this to me. I was baffled. I was a new trainer, and I got this uh, motocross racer, which you know I didn't even know I, at the time. I was like, oh yeah, that's a sport. And he says, uh, yeah, my number one goal is to train my grip and my forearms. Mm. And so I said, oh, I know how to do all that. You know, there's lots of exercises. And I said, so what's the issue? And he goes, well, about halfway through my races, my and he didn't say the pump because he wasn't <clears throat> in with the lingo, right? He says, my forearms get so tight and I lose the dexterity of my hands and their function. Yeah. And I'm like, you mean like they get pumped? And he goes, yeah, exactly. I'm like, what? You? I got to train you in a way to so you don't get a pump when you're doing <laughs> get the pump. Yeah. I experienced it in jujitsu and judo for sure. Like when that would hit, forget it. Grabbing on the gi and doing anything. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. You ever try work. rock climbing? Like that was an experience. That'd be killer. It I was imagine. like immediate like pump that like made it so I couldn't even <laughs> keep going or grabbing things properly. So I noticed it there for sure. Yeah, no. No, I I mean what I was referring to really is just some workouts. If you get a pump, great. If you don't, doesn't mean you had a bad workout. Like strength focused type of workout. No, I, it's a good point to bring up because I was very attached to that in my early years of training, like the the pump. And a lot of that is the this, this superficial idea that you have gotten bigger today. Totally. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And, and so as a young, a young boy that was training to get bigger and wanted to be bigger, 
you know, I, a lot of my workout was like, okay, I look awesome today. So I was chasing that feeling mm -hmm. and that look. Uh, and if I didn't get that, I felt uh, discouraged about the workout. If yeah. I left and I didn't get this super aired up feeling, I would leave the workout sometimes and feel like, oh, that was an okay workout. Mm -hmm. When in reality, that could have been uh, the best workout for me at the time or even better than some of the workouts that I'd done chasing the pump. And yeah. so I think a lot of people probably get sucked into that same thing, especially if you were in, in you get addicted to it. Kid yeah, who was but, trying to get big, you know? Yeah. If you're not building that foundational strength, you know, to keep kind of moving, uh, you know, building mass, you know, beneath that, it's like, uh, you know, it's gonna be fleeting after. Well, I still think it's, it's so fascinating to me that, and we've, I've brought this up several times on the show. I know, uh, Sally, we've, kind of speculated on what's happening and, and there's a lot of theories and ideas, but I don't think we have any like exactly what's happened, mm -hmm. but there's definitely something that I have noticed when, uh, I have started to focus on strength training, uh, more so than hypertrophy training. And that is that the muscle sten tends to look like it hangs around all day versus when I'd always train for the pump, meaning like I'd get this massive pump. I look the biggest ever, but as soon as I walk out of the gym an hour later and I deflate, I go back down to this 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 skinny version of me still. Where and I trained like that for years. And then when I really started to strength train, what I noticed was I may not have aired up as much, but then the muscle that I built, it didn't matter if I was pumped up or not. I could see that I was more muscular or bigger yeah. in the middle of the day, which I think is really interesting. Yeah, the old school bodybuilders would say that the heavy training produced a granite hard muscle so like a granite hard look and then the pump training gave you the Bubbly. big yeah billowy yeah. kind of round looking muscles and the old school bodybuilders would incorporate both I, i've brought this up before where arnold used to do uh like a cycle now majority of his training to be fair was more of that bodybuilding training but he would do a cycle of pure strength training and he said it always gave him more kind of a, of a granite look and they would write about this in magazines and this was all speculation you know what's the science behind it i guess we could speculate and say one causes more muscle fiber growth and the other one causes more sarcoplasmic growth all that fluid and stuff that's in muscle obviously both of them there's a lot of crossover and they contribute to each other so i think they're both important but I noticed the same thing. Like yeah. when I really got into deadlifting, I mean, you're not going to get a huge pump when you deadlift, especially if you do it in low reps. But I got this really hard, kind of strong, muscular back from it. Never got a back pump really from deadlifting. Not like doing higher, you know, rep pull downs or rows. Me either. But I, the, greatest back pump I've ever had in my life is heavy deadlifting and then afterwards doing oh, lat pull down. Oh, what a good down, point. And then going to do lat pull. What a good point. Best pump I've I've ever had on my I back. I noticed the same thing. Is is that combination. So it's like the strength, you don't get the pump, but you're pulling heavy. Yes. Then you go to the more hypertrophy stuff. Yes. Absolutely. And and those two specific, actually, it became like one of my, and I remember I just kind of fell on it. Like it wasn't like something that I had was, th it was going in with that intent. Mm -hmm. I just, Oh, I haven't done lat. I was d heavy deadlifting. This was during the time when I was really trying to push the weight and deadlift. And that was the main focus, mm -hmm. strength focused. And then after I'd done like, you know, four or five sets, I was like, Oh, you know, I'm gonna go do some lat pull down. It's been a while since I've done that. And I just had the most, and after that, that became like my favorite thing to do. Yeah. Like with the thing we always talk about, right? You, I like it. I probably ended up doing it for the next <laughs> well, seven I months. Mean, Every time I deadlifted, yeah. I did lat pull down for it. Cause my back, had this, it, it, I've never felt my back, my entire back pumped. Right. Right. Like when you do certain back exercises, you feel the lats, the traps a little more, maybe rhomboids or maybe your low back. Like, but I felt like the entire back felt like it was. Yeah. All I've had up. the same experience. It must be that muscle recruitment process, right? So you're, you're getting more muscle fibers sort of connected and then we're pumping them, you know, immediately after that. It almost seems like yeah, it's more I try receptive. To, to I that. try to wrap my brain around exactly why that was, why it was so effective. Well, I for can't me. think of an exercise that, creates more tension and load on the whole back than a deadlift. Right. When you're going to pull 500 pounds. You don't do 500 pounds of anything with your back, right? Right. Besides a deadlift. <clears throat> so it's got to be something like that. Right. It has to be. Well, especially since it really lights up the low back more so than almost any other back exercise, right? That, unless yeah. you're doing something like hyperextensions. Like. Yeah. So, oh, so I want to tell you guys, so my kids graduated to actual supplements. So I was, uh, for a while there, I was giving them like gummy you know, oh, like stuff. Yeah. Right. Because I didn't, I didn't, you know, I'd, I'd give them things to like a capsule or a pill to swallow. 
See, I always thought too, I'm like, we didn't have those when we were kids, but like we had we had like shitty cough syrup that was just like taste like all sugar. Oh, we had Flintstones. Do you remember we had Flintstones? Yeah, you yeah, had Flintstones okay. when you were a kid. But those tasted like gar- I mean they were garbage. Yeah. They taste like vitamins. Yeah, did you did your parents give you guys Flintstones? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so did mine. Yeah, we had no. Flintstones. You know what my mom no, gave I had, me? I had the horse pills, dude. She gave me oh, you had the legit one. <laughs> yeah, dude. I was like, oh, like yeah. like choking my way down. No wonder you're such a beast. So yeah, we had I guess the it was training, ones, Adam. Yeah, yeah. I, had the, I had the ones that I thought were candy. I was eating like five or six. Of them. No, you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in the back. <laughs> Trying no, to sneak more. My my mom gave. Like, we had uh, Flintstone vitamins, <clears throat> and then she gave me um, God, what's it called? Carnation instant breakfast or something? Oh yeah, because yeah. it said it had all the vitamins in <laughs> it. Yeah. Oh. And then she bought it's like total. a slim fast type of shit. Like Ovaltine. Like yeah, that, that like was that. like yeah, good yeah. for you. Yeah. Ovaltine. No, no. With my kids, for for a while now, I've been giving them like a like a gummy vitamin D or whatever. And and now what I'm doing is I've got the the Paleo Valley Organ Complex, and that's going to kind of serve as their multivitamin yeah. because they don't eat organ meats. I sneak it in their food sometimes, where I'll take liver and put a little bit in the ground beef and make patties. If I go a little too heavy though on the liver, they for sure can tell because I can tell they're like. It doesn't taste good, you know. And that's a stupid pain. Finally, a positive way to give your kids a complex. Yeah, so so I so I'm giving them organ complex uh, from Paleo Valley, which is you know it's what it's got. It's got liver, kidney, heart in it. Nature's kind of multivitamin. Is that the one you use most often if you're not getting it? Because I know you, obviously you always target naturally, right? I know you yeah. try to get it, but getting liver every single week is tough for some. It's people. just it's not. I mean, I'm I'm going to be honest. It doesn't taste good. Yeah, like and you're gonna go yeah, buy you have to it. disguise it, and that's just it. Yeah, it just doesn't taste good. It looks gross handling it. I know I sound like a big wimp, but whatever, it's true. So yes, the organ complex is it's really freeze dried organs, and it's in capsule form, so it's super easy. to I'm gonna take. have to try that. I was, I was just having conversation with the kids, like they're now old enough to sort of look back and remember that like why their waffles were green and <laughs> why like you know certain things like taste a little different right when then would they go out and eat and order it at a restaurant for instance you know and like we started to tell them like you know it had a lot of spinach in it it had a lot of <laughs> you know kale and like all these things that we just would sneak in. intentionally blend in there and and uh it was great like it was just funny because like they had they had this like oh man I knew something was different. Like it just dawned on them. What, you know? were, what were we talking about? What were you, we used that as a metaphor? We were all talking off air one time together. Yeah, the bait and, we, and switch or something like that. No, no, no. We're talking about this high, sneaking. The, oh, you know what it was? Writing the program. Oh. When we were writing the program, we're talking about like our strategy for clients is to like sneak the spinach into their into the pain instead yes. of like overcomplicating why we're doing this isometric training right here or why we're doing like the specific thing or just selling it in a way that they want to hear. Yeah, yeah. Like this is gonna make you look good, right? Do you remember we're that giving, conversation? Yeah, we're giving medicine with sugar. It's yeah. like the same. Yeah, in the yeah, program. We totally, about that. totally, hundred <laughs> percent. You know, it's funny too. Old school, old school bodybuilders swore by supplementing with desiccated liver tablets, yeah. organ meat. I remember it was. That. Before any supplement became a thing, drink cream. Bef- yeah. Before any supplement became a thing, they would take seven to ten, no joke, desiccated liver tablets between every meal, and swore by the results that they got from it—the muscle, the strength, all the, all that stuff. So, and do they put anything in in it, or is it purely just? Organ? That's all it is. It's just organ. It's just like if you were to pour organ. it all out and then measure it and weigh it, it would be That's equivalent to you. Like say, I took the nine capsules out; it equals three ounces. It's equivalent Less than to, that, but yeah. Well, yeah, okay, so or an, or an ounce or two. It'd be and equivalent the, to taking an ounce or two of the meat. Yeah, now here's the thing with organ uh, meats. They're so nutrient-dense that you Doesn't can actually overdo it. Oh. Oh, yeah. If you ate liver every day, you could run the risk of overdoing some nutrients. It's so dense. In Is that true? Because yeah. I thought I remember reading, I remember I used to say that as a trainer when I first started that, like why we need, it was my pitch to sell supplements. I remember that when I was first starting, and it was that, in order for us to hit all of our daily requirements for nutrients, you would have to consume close to 3,500 calories plus oh, liver. That'll make you overweight. Plus liver every single yeah. day. And you can't do that. That was my point. And you can't do that because our metabolism slowed down so much that you can't eat 3,500 calories without putting body yeah. fat on. So this is why we need to use supplements. No, for, forget the calorie aspect. It's just it's so high in nutrients that you would eat ridiculous amounts of things like iron, uh, vitamin A could be an issue. Mm. You know, things that get stored in the body. So, you know, supplementing a little bit every day is not a bad. So strategy. if you ate liver every day, you think you could t- technically overdo that? Yeah. If you look at the liver, con- like if Doug br- brings up like the iron content of, you know, one chicken liver, which is not small. I don't know if you've ever seen the size of yeah, one. Yeah, it's real small. Really small. 
look up the nutrient content, you'll see that yeah, it's super, super, dense. super dense. Is yeah. it by itself your total RDA for like iron or something? I, mean, I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to look it up. Yeah, but, I would, yeah I've I, heard that. Like, I, find like that really, I find that interesting. There's not a lot of things that we, really we could eat in, in nature that would overdo it, you know? Oh, well, wasn't that why it was like one of the prized uh, organs when there was a kill? So, so like, nine milligrams of iron per two and a half ounce serving. And, what, and what's the RDA for? Yeah. Uh, do you know? Doug, can you look up RDA for iron? And remember, this is... This is uh, heme iron. This is extremely absorbable, usable iron. It's not like the iron you get from. Oh wow! Just eight, eight milligrams. Oh, eight to eight, for eighteen for women. So yeah, for for premenopausal women is eighteen. The median for, dietary intake of iron approximately sixteen to eighteen, and that was nine. So that's it's only half, bro. Yeah, but that's that on top of anything else you may eat, especially if you take a multivitamin, you start to run into some issues. You could. Right. Now, I guess the, and if you also had that, because you would most likely have- By the way, this You is, wouldn't just have a chicken liver by itself. You also have it with, you know, eight ounces of steak too or yes, something else. But right? also you, consider that's for women who are menstruating. So if you look at postmenopausal women and men, it's eight. Yeah. So men, way less iron than women who obviously menstruate because right. they lose so much iron. That's why their multivitamin always has a bunch more iron. Inside. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So mm. yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, it's interesting, right? Yeah, that is interesting. Mm. Actually, speaking of sponsors, um, I want to ask you, I know we're, you know, I'm sure we could discuss some of this on air. Um, we're looking to redo some of our agreements and contracts. How oh, yeah. are we doing? With, uh, how almost, are they doing with us? We're almost, uh, let's see here. I think last night Katrina and I went over, we had... Um, I want to say like three three partners left to still talk about next year. I mean, it was crazy. It started uh, over a month and a half ago of everybody wanted to renew for the following year. So it's been- Already, huh? Yeah, yeah. So we've got most everybody- a um, couple companies, two or three companies still left. You know, it's, you know talking about uh, renewing sponsors, I actually had a call with Caldera just a couple of days ago. And that it blows my mind. I mean, I, I remember. I, I don't know if you guys remember I when do. that got sent to us. And I was like, I started using it. And I'm like, I really want to promote this. And you guys were like, I, yeah, don't, I, like, I don't know, dude. Skincare. Yeah, yeah. yeah. skincare. I don't think it's going to do well. I don't think we'll be able we're to. We're not beauty guys. Yeah, I don't think we're going to be able to give them their even ROI. Even though we look like it. No, <laughs> yeah. I just, and, and you guys had me a little skeptical. And my my kind of selfish part of it was like, well, I just at least want to do it so I can get some free shit. And then hopefully I can keep it and use it. And if it doesn't, the partnership doesn't work out. And they, I mean, they were telling us like they, they obviously do advertising with all kinds of different companies and companies are very health beauty, like specific and nobody produces like, so our audience received that, that partnership better than I would have ever anticipated. A big part of I it, I would that. imagine, maybe you know this, better, you know this better than I do since you handle this is the re, what is it, the repurchase? Rate. Yes. It's once you, it's, I mean, cause it's, it's not a cheap product, right? It's definitely not a cheap product. So I'm sure a lot of people at first glance go like, oh wow, that's kind of expensive to try some face stuff. But if you do, uh, I have yet to meet somebody who used it and go like, I don't see a difference. I oh, mean, yeah, and we've seen makes, the crazy testimonies difference. we've had on the forum and stuff of people showing before and afters of like a month of using it or something. Mm -hmm. I think that one guy with his hands, like was 10 days or something like that. Like, yeah. Yeah, no, there's, and I've had a lot of people who also have psoriasis or eczema, have dry skin like I do, and they've now also moved in that direction, which I love. That's the main reason why I use it is for my psoriasis. I have the psoriasis mm. spots all over my head and my shins and stuff. And instead of using like a, uh, a steroid cream, yeah. which is what the- Well, I never use anything on my face ever. I have naturally oily, you know, Mediterranean Mediterranean skin. You gotta say it that way. Yeah. But, uh, and so I'm always afraid to put anything because I'm like, it's going to just make me oilier, which is, no, it balances me out too. Yeah. Which is kind of and, it, and Justin, who's the opposite, he's dry. Yeah, it it makes dry it as a bone. As a bone, I yeah. still haven't done the the mask yet. Have you done the mask yet, Doug? I know you said I that you it. were you were down. Yeah, yeah, I did it. Oh, you Actually, did it. Yeah. Oh, it worked well. Can't you tell? Okay, so you always look beautiful. Is it, is, it's not a peel off one. It's no, just like a lather. It's like a, a mud mask. Okay. Oh, so it's does it get hard? Yeah, it gets dry. Oh, okay. So it's and then fairly use warm thin. Water. You, you just put it on your face, let it dry out a bit, and yeah. then uh, just rinse it off. Yeah, and then you put warm water on. And how did you feel after? You turn you on feel, the view. Feel good after. I mean, it felt great. Mm. Yeah. How many times have you done it now? Just once. Oh, okay, so you yep. just did it. I need to do it. I haven't done it yet. So. Hey, uh, trivia guy, Justin. Yeah. What is that movie with Liam Nielsen where the they kidnap his Take daughter? It. Oh, yeah, you got taken. It. taken. You just jumped the gun there. Bro. I had to because yeah. you guys don't ever give me an opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, you know something. Yesterday you guys were- I know yes. things. <laughs> Yesterday you guys were so surprised I knew something. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Fuck these guys. Uh, man. I'm getting all offended. Oh, hey, talk to hey, so we're congratulating you. Yeah. So did you guys hear about this dad that- So they're calling him the, like, the taken dad. I'm going to pull this up because this is- What? Bro, this is a crazy story. This happened to him? 
So, so the, and this guy's he got he's going one to of his jail. He's got abducted and he went. And he's going to go to jail. He's going to jail. Hear what happened. See, we should we should have exceptions to the rule in the justice system. Well, for listen to what like happened. This, in my opinion, yeah. his daughter. Pardon him. His daughter had a boyfriend. The boyfriend sold his daughter into sex trafficking. Oh okay, so God. the boyfriend of his daughter took his daughter, basically kidnapped her, sold her into sex trafficking. The father. It's just like the movie. Finds out, rescues his daughter. Then he finds the boyfriend and fucking kills him and puts him in the trunk of his car. What? Anyway, anyway, justice gets caught and is going to jail now. He's going to jail for for murder. Wow, I know. How? What's the age there? Like, how old is she and how old was the boyfriend? Uh, I don't know. Oh, but so say. this happened in this. So check this out. So this like, is this in happened 20- in two thousand fifteen. This isn't, no, 2020. Oh, okay. So you, so you've listen, been known to bring stories up I know. Uh, yeah. This happened in 1975. Real recent. Yeah, yeah. So listen to what happened, dude. He abducted the, the boyfriend, tied him up, placed him in the trunk of a vehicle. Then he hit him with the, in the head with a cinder block and then stabbed him repeatedly. Wow. Killing wow. him, basically. So now he's, uh, now he's going to jail for murder. Bro, I know but, I know how protective yeah, I am, yeah. and I have a son. I hundred like, percent relate. Not, yeah, you can obviously because you have a daughter. Like, I can only imagine um, because I know like it's weird. I think we talked about this before, where I'll watch like a, a show now or a movie or something. Yeah, and it, like it was. As a matter of fact, it was like a, a medieval movie I was watching. I shared this on the podcast a long time ago when I, when I first had Max, and the 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 like king came in and to this this little village and basically said we're taking all the firstborn sons right they take them you know and i i can't remember why or what they do but that was like that's part of like what happened you and teared they, up oh dude yeah. I, i'm not i got enraged you know it's like 10 o'clock at night i'm by myself watching this and i remember like i never felt that kind of emotion go through me yeah. because for the first time in my life i could actually connect to what you know in the past you watch that and you're like oh that sucks so that's fucked up but you don't feel it. I felt it like, whoa! If that happened to me, where someone took my son, like, what would I do? You know, and, and that that dad's faced with that. Like, if he does anything, he gets killed. His son gets killed. His wife gets killed. So he has to stand back and just let them take his kid, or else they all die. So, like, what do you do in I that don't situation? Know. I don't like, know. But if that, I mean, if I, I can, I can understand why this dad would have done that. Yeah. You know? And and the the problem was that he planned it all out because there's been other cases where like oh, yeah, father premeditated. If he would have just like reacted, correct, he could. Probably, yeah, because there was another man in Texas where he walked in on somebody like sexually assaulting his daughter and he beat the guy to death, ended up not going to jail because you know it was like a he was in the moment, yeah, and he was enraged and stuff. So, but because Hmm. this appeared to be planned, yeah, that now he's going to jail. So it's like, how do you like I'm all thinking in my head, like, how would I structure it to look like (laughs) (laughs) you gotta be more calculated? How do I, yeah, how do I premeditate more Uh, to make sure it looks like I did? Yeah, exactly. I ran into him on the street and just was overcome with rage and just murdered him right there on the street, (laughs) yeah, you know, yeah. But I mean, crazy story that you know that that happened. You mess with someone's kid, it's like. No. You know, and who knows what the whole story is? You know, maybe the dad that's, was a good. Dad and that, right that's there. recent. That happened this year. Is twenty twenty. Oh wow, that's crazy. I know, dude. It's I wanted little... to. Con- so there's a couple things I've been waiting to talk to you guys today because I, I had uh, been reading some articles, I listened to some podcasts, and there was two conversations that I, I want to continue with you guys. Uh, one of them was the conversation around Facebook's Meta, uh, and then the other one was the Zill- Zillow talk we we're talking. So All right, first, let's start with Facebook. Yeah, start with Facebook. How much do you guys know about w- this metaverse that they're trying to do? Did you guys know also that Microsoft is building a competitive one at the same time, right? Do you know that? So it's kind of like this race to, and I didn't, I didn't know this. Like, so it's the multiverse, Justin. This is how it started. Well, it's, Dude. so yep. there's, you have the, you have <laughs> the, happening. you have the big ones, right? You have, uh, Google, yes. um, you have, and, and Google and Apple are more interested in AR and Facebook and, uh, Microsoft are more interested in the, the virtual reality. So you have, it's AR versus VR. So augmented reality versus virtual reality. Right. And augmented reality is more like um, like Google glasses where you'd be able to put yeah. them on and so then it, 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 it integrates with, with real world. It's like stuff. the movie real Free life. Guy when he puts the glasses on. Ding, ding, ding. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's, I think more, that's more realistic personally. That's what I Well, think. I mean, there's there's a lot of argument that they're they're both equally realistic. And the question is, you know, will they live together or will they be, you know, exclusive of each so other? So when you get, when you wake up and go to work or school, you're in AR. When you go home, you plug into VR. Right. Or um, just maybe it attracts yeah. different types of people. But, you know, I didn't know that. I didn't know that Microsoft, did you guys know that Microsoft was no. building? Well, Doug, could you look up the name? I think theirs is actually called Metaverse also. So I think, really? I, I think Facebook is called Meta and then, then Microsoft is calling theirs Metaverse, but they're both in this 
race to get to this place we're going to live, which also hmm. made me start to look at NFTs totally different because just like a couple months ago when oh, we first talked about them. Oh, snap. I, started, I know exactly where you're going. Yeah. I know. And by the way, Facebook has already said that they, they were going, they're they going to integrate NFTs into their metaverse. Of course. Metaverse. Am I saying the, that wrong? Meta, metaverse. What I think it's are, meta. Metaverse? Metaverse. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You know what, wrong. dude? That makes perfect sense because do you guys know that already there's already people that will spend thousands of dollars on a rare... Minecraft skin or yes. you know acts in a particular move yes. the game or so now it makes sense because now if you I live, totally see the NFT thing yes if you live in this metaverse universe if this is where you spend most of your time well now yeah you are going to spend a lot of money on it's something. no different than the way we floss with watches cars designer clothes exactly. today in real life because if 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 you spend now more of your time in the virtual world than you do in the real world then why why would i buy designer jeans in the real world i would much rather buy them in this this virtual world where i spend more of my time and, and you more, get clout and, yeah and i interact with more people because people will know they'll see it and they'll know oh you got that skin yeah that's got to be 10 grand at least for you that got the thing. diamond shield Meanwhile, so now i Cheeto see it like everywhere. the whole nft thing i thought was so weird and ridiculous and i couldn't wrap my brain around like why would someone like you want like we brought the painting thing right like why the fuck do i want a painting, a, a digital, digital painting. painting painting that I'm going to do nothing. But if you live in a digital world right, and you, you have a digital house your and house. Yeah, your exactly. friends hang out in your digital house, you now have this crazy rare painting, digital painting in your uh, in your virtual house where now it matters. Now when people come over to hang out in your virtual house, they do go, you oh think, my God. Do you think that current yeah. like brick and mortar businesses and manufacturers will get into it? Like for example, would BMW... Get into creating of NFT cars. Of course. Well, this is why I've always speculated that like artists and um, you know creative people like there's like this this massive there's gonna be a massive boom uh, and need for you know that uh, in terms of like being able to create all these things for those types of worlds, right? So you need to be able to have like, so it's more, it's going to be more um, beneficial to have the plans and designs mm -hmm. for houses or whatever. Like we were talking about like 3D printing yeah. too. So it's like, it's all kind of moving in that direction in terms of like you being able to actually, you know, come up with these designs, create and sell those okay. designs versus actually like producing it. Okay. So I want to get, and I want to go to what you were bringing up about Zillow, but before we do, cause this reminds me of something that's tied very close to this okay so we've heard the theories that maybe we live in an you know a artificial reality yeah and that when life gets intelligent enough the its tendency is to create virtual realities eventually becoming so advanced that people within it's indistinguishable it, it's indistinguishable and maybe this is why things are the way they are or whatever simulation theory right? yeah so yeah. that's one theory and then there's a, there's a couple other things that are really interesting so uh, are you guys familiar with in physics the double slit experiment? Have you heard of that? Yes. I've shown you guys before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've talked it. about this. So it what, they'll, familiar. what they'll do is they'll fire uh, particles, electrons or protons, I believe, through something that has two slits. So it can only travel through the two slits, or it gets bounced off. And when it travels through, they notice a particular pattern coming out and emerging out the other end. But when they observe to see which slit the particles are traveling through, the pattern changes completely. It, it's either a wave or it's it's particles or it like changes the whole property. Of so it. in other words, just yeah, to just explain what, what, so in other what, words, what are we figuring out there? What, what they're trying to see is, okay, why is it creating this strange pattern on the other yeah. end? Be, we need to see what's happening. Which slit are these particles going through? So we're going to observe this, this, these slits to see what's happening. But then as soon as they observe it, the pattern changes and it behaves in a very predictable manner. Mm -hmm. So this is called the observer effect. And it's a very strange phenomena in quantum physics. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the, it, many scientists believe that this is one of the reasons why we can't make, you know, uh, Newton's theory of relativity and Newton, what's called Newtonian physics, right? Which is like physics of this world. Why it doesn't seem to match up with quantum physics, which they don't seem to make any sense. Quantum physics is very strange compared yeah, it to behaves completely different. Totally different. And so, and there's this observer effect that they constantly they can test. And like, what the hell does the observer have to do with any of this? So the 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 quantum physics says that all of reality 
exists in what's called superposition. So it's everything all at once, and it only collapses into what we observe when we're observing it. So the observer has some kind of an influence over this. Yeah. So this team of scientists came together and came up with this theory, and they said that, and other scientists have said this before as well, that consciousness is intricately connected to reality. And without consciousness, reality would not exist. Mm -hmm. And that it's a network of observers that creates reality. Without that, then there really isn't this reality that we- right. So and, based and this off network is actually also describing like quantum entanglement, right? So like something all of you do affects like this this network of so, like- Well, based off of that theory, we then would be able to potentially create consciousness in, uh, in, uh, in AI. Right. Well, it, well so if that's if that's the the formula that creates consciousness, then we should be able to actually program as long that. As we're into, well, that's it, a, that's another. Which, problem. by the way, I listened to like the leading guy. We went. I went down this rabbit hole. So yeah. it's great you're going this direction because I just finished watching Patrick Bet David interview, and the guy's name is going to slip me. But Bill Gates, Elon Musk, like this is the dude. Like this is who they have read okay. all his stuff. I can't. He's got a number one selling book on on um, on AI. And they had an interview, and he was talking all about. It wasn't this. Ray Kurzweil, was it? No, maybe Doug. Okay. You can look up uh, uh, look up Patrick Bet David uh, AI interview, and it'll it'll pop him up. Bald guy, glasses. Um, but really interesting because uh, he said some stuff. No, that's neither one of them. Uh, he was talking about the the capabilities that I mean, it's kind of limitless. It seems so crazy for us right now, but it's kind of limitless what we can potentially program and everything down to feelings and consciousness. Well, so think about so so that's a different question, right? The other that question is what is consciousness? But if we which we still can't define, but forget that for a second. I think we can all agree that humans are consciousness or we have some kind of consciousness and it's our collective observation that's creating our reality. Okay, so what is this how does this tie to this meta universe that we're talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay, think of it this way. You're playing um, Grand Theft Auto, right? You're walking through a neighborhood. As the character that you're playing, the avatar that you're playing is walking through the neighborhood, the video game is creating the reality as you're moving through. Right. But if you're not moving through the reality, if you're not moving through as a character, all of that is in the game as a potential. It only appears. In other words, you're walking through Minecraft. The tree appears over here. It's only because you're walking through the video game with your avatar. If you're not doing anything, that's it. Just it ex hasn't revealed itself. hasn't It hasn't been. It really hasn't necessarily been created. It's in the game in this kind of potential. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if you think of it that way, it's kind of like we're in a game, right? Where it's our observation that creates that reality. Otherwise, it's like. And then here, take it a step further. I know this is totally a, a weak conversation. <laughs> Yo, we been I wish you would have told me we're I going know, here. I, I would have totally smoked. No, I know. We're gonna, I'm going to stop in just a second but, uh, before we lose <laughs> Please everybody. Please don't. That was, that was fun stuff but, for me. So the Big Bang, right? Everybody, the, the scientists agree that, oh, there was a Big Bang at one point. All of the matter of the universe was in this one infinitely small point, and then it exploded and expanded, and you know it's expanding faster and faster and blah, blah, blah. What if that's when the game got turned on? That's mm -hmm. when the switch went on, boom, and you had this explosion of matter, and then consciousness created this universe. You're describing isn't that what, Tron. Isn't that kind of what it looks like if we shut off our off-road, what it looks like? It goes, Poof. Yeah. It goes down to this little tiny... <laughs> it does. <laughs> yeah, dude. If, if you shut one of these yeah. screens off, yeah, that's exactly what it stops. does. It goes, it goes boom. And it, and it like it dissolves into this tiny little point. Dude. Well, anyway. it trips me out because we're all basically light particles, you know. Oh, at the end of the day, I mean, this shit just melts my mind to think about. Well, it's what it what's crazy to me is I know that we have been on and off air talking about this whole you know plugged in unplugged yeah. worlds that are coming and everything like that, and it, it feels like all of a sudden we just took ten steps forward out of nowhere. Like I, it was, it's happening yeah, faster. And faster. I know. Really quick, all of a sudden, it's got a compound. Yeah, it effect. seemed kind of ridiculous talking about it five years ago, and now you're talking about two companies. Well, if you really want to melt your your brain, uh, if if real life existed, like you know, trillions of years ago, and then created artificial universes, and then those artificial universes became self aware and created their own, we literally could be in a billion layers deep of a fucking you know 
fake universe or simulation or whatever you want to call it of right. universes creating the so we were universe. just like pixelated you know like when it just first happened yeah, yeah. who knows all right yeah. so his name was uh, the guy you were talking about nick bostrom is that yeah him? yeah Super so supposedly is like the authority on artificial intelligence like wow. the, he's like the, the the main the main dude that i'm afraid that we're going to create what we think is consciousness and it's not and it's just going to create a monster you know what i mean like well, yeah, we think it is. Yeah, you should listen to that interview because yeah. it is a. It's not scary because he 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 has a very optimistic view of where, where he hopes, but he doesn't deny that. You know, it's all about how we program this shit, and you know, if China's programming it, we're programming it. We we got to hope that we're all running by the same moral code. Yeah. Dude, you know, speaking, and that's kind of the really the AI arms race. Which, by yeah. the way, people don't know this. There's another arms race that's already started. There's the the hypersonic missile arm race. You know, China launched mm -hmm. that hypersonic China, missile, Russia. traveled around the globe, surprised us. Now we're doing our own. Now they're talking about having satellite bl exploding capabilities where they mm -hmm. can fire something at a satellite. It'll blow up or destroy the inside of the satellite to make it look like a mistake. And they could just dis dis totally disrupt communication. And then yeah. Taiwan came out with their first exoskeleton for their military. Which is basically, oh, wow. like, yeah, makes you stronger, I've seen those, run faster. Yeah. <laughs> so, those are pretty cool. It's all going down. Yeah, uh, all right, that's so, why. I, that's why I get into science fiction. I'm telling you, it's been prepping humanity to see what the potential lies, and we're already getting into the potential of it all. It'd man. be cool to see like a montage of like all the like uh, you know futuristic movies that have been happening since the 70s and 80s. Yeah. yeah, and like the, all the ones that like we actually still don't have a freaking hoverboard. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Is that the one you're waiting on? Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> I've been or, waiting. Yeah, or, or, <laughs> or food that rehydrates. Like every every uh, like sci-fi movie one. in the last 50 or 60s was like a capsule yeah. that you Doo -doo -doo -doo. place in it. Yeah. You have a little cube and then it just yeah, it turns, turns into turkey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, turkey dinner. Or whatever. All right, so Zillow. You wanted to talk about Zillow. Oh, so what's yeah, the deal so, with that? Well, a couple things. One, um, I mean, I'm, I feel a little ashamed or embarrassed that like I didn't even know of this like uh, – category right they're called i buyers right so i've heard that term like like i become i'll be watching like a, a, a video on youtube or reading an article and they, they reference it and i never like dug into like exactly what an i buyer is and it's an the examples would be like um open door redfin uh zillow and it's these 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 massive companies that are uh, buying real estate like really really fast. And like, did so, you say like five thousand properties a month? Yeah. Was the goal? Well, they, so uh, Zillow just did eight thousand in a quarter. Wow. So that's why when this big news came out of them getting rid of seven thousand was such a big deal is because they're buying uh, they're buying eight thousand a quarter with a goal to get up to five thousand. But what I find interesting is like you know at what point can they actually start to manipulate the real estate market the same way that we manipulate stocks yeah. with people buying? I f I smell legislation coming. Yep. That's what I smell. Yeah, it's because imagine if uh, you know seventy percent of the rental properties in America are owned by two owners, you know, Zillow and Redfin. Well, so check this out right now. This is why uh, this is interesting to me right now. Doug, maybe you can pull up the ticker right now on both Redfin and Zillow and even Open Door, all three of those, because in the last three days, they are dropping hard, like on the stock market. Hmm. So their stock was losing, I think, 15%, 10%, and like 9%. Is it because they sold at losses and... Well, I mean, all all of them. Redfin is so something. It intro, oh yeah, wow, Zillow's it's down, down 19, again. Or no, twenty three percent. Wow, right now. Wow. You know what though? That's actually a damn good buy. Sixty five for a share is not. Well, I'm good. waiting. So I'm waiting for it to keep going. So Redfin's show me. down four percent. They're at forty eight right now as of the recording. Was that Zillow you just had up before that, Doug? Yeah. Yes. Bring it back up to that and show me the the graph for the the court the last week so we can I can see that show the guys like the, the Well, I mean there's the there's what is that? Is that's that a, a day? day. That's, that's just a day, day dude. Wow. Look at the fi so, look at the Oh yeah. That's the so 5 days. It just oh. fell off a cliff a after that. And they're all kind of falling off right now. Still I find that really interesting that you have these companies that have this much bu uh, p buying power in real estate, and then they're selling that off. Now, part of the reason why they did that big sell-off too was, boy, the the room for error in this algorithm was ridiculously crazy. Like the, it was, they they buy targeting a three to six percent uh, a game. tiny margin, tiny margin. So that's what the algorithm is, is built off, and they have like these. What they look for is houses in areas of like towns that are growing, which is a basic kind of strategy for buying mm -hmm. real estate. And they don't want it to be, they don't want it to be perfect, but they want the homes to be really nice. And all it really needs is quick facelift, like paint, 
floors, and then flip. But yeah, and then and then flip and make three to six percent off it because they're what they're doing is they the algorithms based off of what the the trend of where the market's going, and they're mm. they're getting that on a daily you know the basis. The problem with that is it's too logical. It is. Yeah, because there's and, and so it's, much human and emotion there's, And there's involved. emotion involved in, in in buying real estate. And so, but this algorithm is based off of that. And it was just aggressively buying at that. And then it, all it took was a slight plateau and then them overbidding aggressively to get that to make it not worth it. Wow. Mm-hmm. So but I mean, if you think sell-off. about three three to six percent profit margin doesn't sound like much, but property is so expensive and you're buying 5,000 units. Three percent of that is millions and millions of yeah. dollars. Yeah, yeah. So potentially could be massive. It's really, and uh, you, you know, it's what's happening is you have, um, and you have like obviously brokers and real estate agents that are not fans of. I mean, obviously, if you work with them, you're probably a fan of Redfin or Zillow or one of them. But if you're a private broker, real estate agent, because the ultimate goal and what they're trying to do with all these algorithms, and they're trying to basically cut out the middleman. Mm-hmm. You know, why have a real estate agent anymore? If you can, if we can have all this stuff to mm-hmm. if, imagine if you could get onto Zillow and it not, it could show you break down the last 20 years of which it has a lot of this stuff already, like where, where the house was, where it's going, mm-hmm. what it predicted. Is it, you know, you know how uh, you ever seen that? What is it? Car gurus. It tells yeah. you if it's a good deal or bad deal yeah. and it's green or red or it's orange. If it's just like an OK deal. Like imagine if it was that sophisticated that, you know, I don't even need to go look at the property. I can, I, all this stuff gets, informs me right away. I can buy it all digitally. We can already do that. That's how we buy homes online. You're not even there in person. So you could do it all through, you know, DocuSign. You know what? This is an interesting conversation because I think in, in lots of markets, they've tried to eliminate the human salesperson. Mm-hmm. I think in some cases it works. In other cases, I think they over they underestimate the value of the human. Well, to the point you just brought up, because yeah. emotions are involved. And, well, we look talked at fitness. about this in fitness. Yeah. This happened in fitness. 24 Hour Fitness did this. This is one of the, one of the, one of the, the this is the beginning of their downfall um, was that they, they exactly said that, by the way. I was in the meeting when they brought that up and yeah. they literally said, we have the most gyms, we have great equipment, we're open 24 hours, all we need to do is have the best prices and we'll crush everybody. And it would be as easy as having a menu. Someone walks in, points at what they want, and they sign up. Right. And me as a general manager who understood nobody's buying my gym for the gym. They're buying it for us. I know right. that. I've worked in shitty gyms and crushed. And I've seen great gyms fail because of the team and the staff. And I remember thinking, this is a bad idea. You mm-hmm. guys don't realize the value. That's well, so what happens when people, people at such a high level are making the decision that are purely looking at numbers yep. where someone like you or I who was down in the trenches doing it, I could easily go like, well, yesterday we sold 10 deals. And I know for a fact, seven of those wouldn't have got sold had I not got involved in it and convinced that person. Yeah, and talked about the dream yeah, and To the make them do you that. paint the picture. Yeah. Yes. Right. Now, in other cases, it works, right? Electronics. Right. Like you want to buy a phone, you, you know, 10 people could sell an iPhone. They're all the same. Well, I'm going to get the best price, right? Um, with cars, it did disrupt the market, but have car salesmen disappeared? No, because I think in some cases, people want to talk to a salesperson and understand what's going on. Yeah. Houses are way more emotional than oh, that. Oh, yeah, way more emotional. There's a lot more involved than just looking at it. And so I wonder how this is actually going to, you know, kind of pan out. Yeah. But it is really interesting to me that the, I wonder why Zillow wouldn't buy a bunch of properties and then short term rent them. That's their business. Like, why wouldn't go? Why wouldn't they go? Is that because they'll be cannibalizing their own people or competing against the, peop- the people that make their business what well, it oh, is? First of all, I don't know if Zillow is not involved in short-term rentals. I don't know that for a fact. I don't no. know enough about them to know if they are in that market also. Hmm. I mean, I think they require. I would require a lot more... I guess personnel and management, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean it'd be interesting. I mean, it's it's I'm now intrigued enough that I want to find the right person to interview because I'd love to ask a lot of like the questions by of like, what their strategy is. By, by yeah. the way, they're trying to disrupt. Well, so that that's new to me. Like the, yeah. I I've now learned that one of the main strategies by these these companies is pr- pretty much to cut out the the other the think about how much money is there too, by the well, way. Yeah. Real estate agent is three percent, three percent on yep. front and back end. So that's mm-hmm. if you could just cut out one of them, right? If you just cut out one of them, you got three percent on every single You're way competitive. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So here's my question for 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 you, Adam. Um, you know, because this is something you're really deep into. As a real estate investor, an individual, this sounds like this is a good thing because now you're buying properties yourself, trying to build your own wealth and you know security. And now you see these big players going to the markets trying to buy up properties. Does that mean that now the demand is higher and it's going to increase property values more? Well, it, it's, it could be good and bad, right? So there's, it's, okay, 
my concern with companies like this that are that massive with that much power is their ability to manipulate the market and mm -hmm. send a false signal. So yeah, it could be good because it's going to drive sure. up purchases and more, and, and it's going to be and drive the price price up. And obviously, if you are an investor and you own properties, there's a good there's actually a good side of inflation, right? Of all that stuff going up, but uh, it's not good if it's being manipulated intentionally. Where you know, if you think you those pull houses off the market when you want to, or or, or like what's about to happen with Zillow, all of a sudden all show. putting seven thousand houses on the market. Now, mind you, that's probably that's dispersed over. I think it was like four or five states and probably different cities. And so, it's obviously if there's just ten or twenty houses in all these little cities, probably not going to hurt the market. But imagine if like one of these companies had five hundred and like okay, uh, Boise, Idaho, one of the, it was the fastest growing. Uh, it grew the most. Uh, equity over the last two years, okay, more than anywhere else, like 34%. So Boise, Idaho is number one in the country. Imagine if uh, Zillow, Redfin, Open Door owned uh, 5,000 of the houses in uh, Boise, Idaho. Of the, let's say, I don't know how many houses are in there, 50,000 or, yeah. oh God, I don't have no idea, but let's just say they own yeah, 10%. Eight, yeah, 10% of it. And then all of a sudden they decide together, we're going to sell it all. Mm -hmm. They could literally just die, but dive bomb that market temporarily, then turn Lower around the cost and cost of everything, go that, back and that's buy right. Then go right. back and buy again. So I, I'm the really people curious. have done this with the stock market before all the time rules against yeah. it. So I, and, and, and I'm sure I'll get messages. So I look forward to hearing from someone who is going to school me on this. Cause I don't know if there's already laws in place that don't allow these guys to do this because yeah. I can see, I mean, if you, uh, if you're, if Zillow's goal is to get up to 5,000 properties a month. Oh yeah. And I wonder if it varies state to state, you know, in terms of legislation. Well, oh, okay. I'll take it to a national security potential. Now you have a private American company like Zillow. Let's say they build up their portfolio to own 500,000 properties and China or another foreign country, one that does not align with our values, for example, says I'll buy Zillow. They immediately own half a million properties in the United yeah, hard States. Hard assets, yeah. Right. I mean, now that's very interesting. Yeah, I, I could see, I, I mean, I don't know what if that's a good or bad thing or what that would mean necessarily, but I could see the political ramifications of that. Yeah. You know, because we saw what happened with TikTok and how that got political because you know, yeah. they were owned by China. Yeah, no, it's really, it's really interesting. Well, speaking of like real estate talk, that I wanted to, sh I shared a tweet from uh, Robert Kiyosaki uh, this morning that I thought was interesting. We've talked a little bit about this, but he actually dropped some stats I thought that were interesting. Listen to this stat 77% of people who inherit family wealth lose it in less than three years. Oh, wow. 70, less than three years? 77%, dude. You know what that flies Almost in the 80%, face of? Eight out of ten people who, who inherit wealth lose it within three years. By the way, you know what that flies yeah. in the face of? Yeah. It, it's also 80% of millionaires today were self-made. Okay, so Eight out of ten millionaires right now are self-made. 77% of people who inherit money lose it within three years. It's almost like doesn't matter. That right. flies in the face of the uh, the narrative that, oh, successful people, wealthy people, yeah. it's because mom and dad gave them money and they didn't earn it They're themselves. They're just immediately wrong. guaranteed success. Yeah, no, it doesn't, it doesn't Isn't work that Isn't that wild? Way. I, yeah. I thought that was really Crazy. wild. 65% I mean, of all professional uh, athletes end up going bankrupt five years after yeah. retirement. Well, okay. You know what's funny? So I'm sure some people are disagreeing with what I said. If we put it, if we, if we, just take that and use an analogy related to fitness. If I snap my fingers right now and made everybody in America lean and fit, would what percentage of them would be able to maintain? Well, that's that? so. I had a really, <laughs> I had a really healthy debate with one of our uh, followers about this, and one of the things that I argued was, and I, I said I don't know the answer, right? But um, would I be here today if I didn't go through all the shit that I had to go through? Right. Uh, th there's a part of me that argues that. That is what got me here was that mm -hmm. I I had so much I had to overcome yeah. that it built this resiliency in me as a young child that later on became an adult that viewed the world differently versus if I was born into a family with way more privilege, would it actually be an advantage? And at, at face value, we all want to say, of course it would be. You could go to greater schools and you have yeah. greater connections and like, okay, but what about the what it does for my character mm -hmm. you know if i got all those things maybe i become a spoiled little bitch yeah, who you, thinks that he deserves everything and is entitled you, you and don't even value any of it in front of you yeah well, then i have who, no work ethic you then, know I, what it then is. I have no resilience I, I i fail and i cry and i can't get back up you like, know what it, you know what it is is you have the this combination of genetics and this combination of your nature which is the stuff around you excuse me nurture which is your life around you and it's the right mix like maybe your genes 
are the kind of genetics that make you that adversity drives you to become great. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so in that particular scenario, that's what made you do really well. And in another scenario, not so much. So it's the combination. Of, will, how, will we ever know the answer? No, it's impossible. How could you possibly know yeah. what the right combination is that would produce success? Well, this is why I really loved that conversation uh, with Jewel. Uh, because of her upbringing and like being like severely abused and, and beaten and, and then homeless and like all these like insane like adversity like she's facing and then like you know just the mindset taking her into positions and, and opportunities that then all of a sudden now you know has this this incredible success that she's able to kind of navigate and figure out how to not completely blow it because of all of these hurdles and things that you know you build that strength and muscle to be able to navigate through well, i do get why people feel the opposite though because i at a time in my life i did i was on the other side of that like when i was in my early 20s i was resentful I was angry at my my parents because of the the childhood that I had. Right. That didn't get that didn't get flipped around until I was thirty, almost thirty. Mm -hmm. Did I start to look at it as, from a different lens and go like, you know what? I'm actually really glad that all these crazy things happened to me as a kid growing up because there's so many things now that I've experienced in my twenties and now going into my thirties that had I not gone through that adversity as a kid, I probably would have viewed these things differently. And and who knows, that might have knocked me down and out into depression. I wouldn't be able to get back up, whereas I didn't, I faced it differently. And so then I began to look at it different. So I have a feeling that a lot of that narrative comes from uh, immaturity. It doesn't matter how old you are. You could be older and still immature, mm -hmm. just immaturity and not really knowing the value of what potentially doing that, or not knowing how that varies from person to person. So you, I mean, you bring up a great point. Maybe part of my genetics that played in my favor, but you know, maybe if it was maybe somebody else's genetics, that is just all it takes to throw them into depression and then they never I, get out of it. I don't know. It's, it is an interesting question. I mean, um, you know, I, I'm the product of, of poor, uneducated immigrants and uh, they would, would I be who I am if it wasn't from, I mean, and look, here's, I remember getting an argument with, I had a friend of mine who argued about how, you know, uh, every, I had everything given to me type of deal. And I'm like, you had, you, you had more than I did getting started. And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, how, how many years or decades has your family been in this country? So my parents came here with nothing, had no education. The, the only advantage they had is they knew the opportunity. So they, they didn't squander it. They knew what they could potentially, you know, build and create here. Yeah. And so who knows what the answer, but I tell you this, I'll bet this money all day long, regardless of, your potential, um, if you work hard and you have a growth mindset, you are more likely to reach your higher potential uh, I, even, than you are the lower potential, regardless step, of where you're I'll at. I'll take right. it even a step further. If you just have an optimistic mindset versus a pessimistic mindset. You know, but growth mindset. Whether, like, whether, whether I am, you think I, you can or can't, you're probably right. Yeah, like I take personal responsibility. I'll work hard. Oh, this is shitty, but let me keep going. Like whatever you're, even like, look at it this way. Again, I'll take it back to fitness. Let's say your genetic potential is your max bench press is 200 pounds and your minimum is that you'll never be able to bench press over 10 pounds. Hard work, effort, personal responsibility, consistency, you're more likely to get to 200 and, and less likely to hit that You know, 10 pounds. Same thing with anything. So maybe your max potential is that you'll make six figures in your life because who well, knows? this is the danger. You're more likely to reach it with those habits. This is the dangers of the conversation around inequality. I mean, it's it's whether it's it is true. There's plenty of situations in this world where there it's we're unequal. It's unfair for this person or that person. But that becoming such a mainstream narrative, I think, has more negative effect than has positive effects. Oh yeah, right. people people well, uh, people that are that. Was, activists around it are just like, oh, it's we need to create more awareness around. It. I said, uh, do you? Is there anybody on this earth that doesn't think that there's people that have more advantages than other people? And then us always talking about it. Are we not training the generation that's coming up to just like them? Yeah. They either fall. They're either you How are. They push you're it? either an oppressor or you're a victim. It's like you. You. That's one or the other. And which one are you? And like that becomes like this conversation with even these young kids coming up. And is that it? Is that a smart or dangerous mindset to to be? Putting them or putting them in that. In I that. would never. Let well, me put it this it, way: it's not empowering. It actually yeah. takes away Look, your power. As a trainer, trying to help people create a lifelong good relationship with exercise and nutrition, the the worst possible thing I could ever do is sit there and talk about the limitations of someone's genetics and how they'll never be able to accomplish certain things just because. Right. You know, your parents were both overweight. You don't got the great bone structure. 
You know, you getting tend to started late. Yeah. That, I never. That's yeah. not, <laughs> You're not that's very strong. I don't care them. what that is. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah, that's great. Okay, but you can't control that. Here's what we can control. And I, I found success that way. The other way, I would have found failure every single time with my clients. So I don't. So it applies, in my opinion, it applies to everything. I think it's a terrible idea to focus on those uncontrollables and rather focus on the things you can control. A lot of it has to do with the stuff you have within your own power, whatever that is. That's right. Yeah. Hey, look, real quick before we get to the rest of the show, do you like soda? Of course you do. It's delicious, but it's bad for you. Well, check this out. Olipop makes soda drinks. They taste like sodas, like the ones you grew up drinking when you were a kid or maybe the ones you have issues with now. But here's the difference. Super low in calories, low in sugar, all natural, and good for your gut health. No joke, Olipop soda drinks are good for gut health. I know that sounds crazy, but it's legit. This is the only delicious tasting drink that we support. It's really awesome stuff. Go check them out. Head over to drinkolipop.com forward slash mind pump and then use the code mind pump for 20% off. That's it. All right. Enjoy the rest of the show. Our first question is from Nicholas Wells. Is there an optimal body fat percentage for building muscle? 11.23%. That is the percentage. Uh, kind of an interesting question. It um, is. You know, I can tell you that I don't think there's going to be a number specific from person to person, but I can say this, that being too lean has been shown to inhibit muscle growth um, and being too over fat can do the same thing. Part of it has to do with the hormonal effects. For example, when men start to get into the single digit body fat percentages, you tend to see testosterone levels dropping. You tend to see growth hormone levels sometimes having issues. Um, androgen receptor density starts to go down a little bit. When their body fat percentage is too high, same thing. So, okay, what are those numbers? Personally, for me, my best like muscle building body fat percentage tends to be above 10% and below maybe 14%. When I go above 14%, I start to get kind of negative returns where I'm just gaining more body fat than muscle. Under 10%, really hard for me to build muscle and maintain that lean body fat percentage unless I'm allowing my body fat percentage to go up. Yeah, that, I was going to say that it, this depends, right, on how we're talking about this because the most anabolic I have ever felt is – after cutting down to three percent and then going back the other direction, yeah, but you're letting your body fat climb right. Up with it. So I mean, but, but imagine maintaining. Is there an optimal body fat percentage for building muscle? Like, oh yeah. So if I was trying not to be big, more body fat than three percent, then yeah, you're yeah, right. It. But if I cut all the way down to three percent and then I reversed into a bulk from there, mm -hmm. and just say I'm not worried about it going. And, and honestly, this is how I would do it after a show, and I would get down to that kind of three percent range or so give or take, I would allow myself to go all the way back up to about nine, ten percent. Mm. And I it was like I was on the gain train all yes. the way until I started to see myself reaching that nine percent or so. And then I would back off because I would say somewhere in that nine percent range I felt the most primed for for building muscle. Yeah. So but uh you know again I think there's tr tremendous value in cutting down and getting lean and then reversing now, the maybe not as extreme as you did it right because i want to be i also want to caution the audience yeah, it's not for a health. bunch of dudes that are like oh i gotta get down to three percent uh, before right. i because no. that is a, a whole getting below i'd say eight percent body fat for the average guy there's a whole different ball game you get below five percent body fat and you're playing now in a whole nother universe in terms of how you feel hormones how they respond your sleep it's not Great. Um, so yeah, don't don't cut down to three percent to try to reverse out. Yeah, no, <laughs> I'm not. Cover. I'm by no means. This is not a uh, recommend. Obviously, this is not a uh, overall health right. uh, type of a question. Yeah. This is you know where do I feel that the optimal body fat percentage is, and I don't know. I, I don't know if there's an exact it's, percentage or it's more about wh where you are in your training and yeah, what you're. I think more of that. Like I was thinking, I'm trying to speculate. Even I've had clients that came in way overweight and uh you know just just maintaining whatever calorie amount they're at but now adding in resistance training had a dramatic shift uh you know in terms of like them and their potential for building muscle but uh, yeah. it makes a good point in terms of like being at, you know at your leanest and now introducing maybe you're a little more sensitive to those calories and, and sort of reprioritizing right. those yeah. calories into muscle building so yeah, i feel like you're primed to be anabolic because yeah. your body's wanting to add and then I, you feed it the way you want yeah but to your point about and i think 
you're probably you're probably more right on where this 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 question is coming from because I get a lot of people who are somewhere between uh, 13 and 20 percent body fat, and their question is, should I cut first or should I bulk? And the answer for me is, if you're north of 15 percent, the the I think you mentioned this right. Yeah. That's where your 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 testosterone levels tend to dip after that. Definitely after 20 percent, you start to notice. They say after 15. Yeah, yeah. yeah 15 what... you'll see it. Definitely after 20. Yeah. In women, it's like 30. So right? in that case, if you're somebody who's just getting started on your teen and you're like, okay, I'm 18, 19 percent body fat, is, is it more advantageous for me to try and bulk and build muscle from here, or is it better for me to lean down a little bit than more? I would probably suggest leaning out a little. But yeah. it depends on their metabolism. Yeah, exactly. I, right. That that's the big thing is that. If I get you, say you're at 18 to 20 percent body fat, but you're you're and you're okay. Let's say a, let's use a, a male since I think this is a guy who's asking this question. So let's say you're 220 pounds, 19 percent body fat, and you want to know what you should do here, but you're only eating okay. This yeah, 220 calories are low. Yeah, 2,000 to 2,200 calories. I don't want to cut you. Yeah. yeah, I don't want I don't want you to lean out right now. I want to build. So even though. You, it might be more advantageous to be 13% body fat trying to build muscle because your 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 body is in a better position to build more muscle. Your metabolism isn't the, in the most optimal position, and I care about that first before I try and attack yeah, the, now the next. All, now, equation, all things being equal, because I think what you're if you're obviously if you're watching this, you realize that there's a lot context. There's a lot of context that matters. And it depends on the individual. And I know people hate it when that when we answer that way, but that's just the way it is whenever you're working with individuals. You have to look at the whole picture. But all things being equal, okay? Everything's healthy. They're not a newbie with resistance training necessarily. So forget the stimulus. The workout's good, good sleep. All things being equal, I think I could say probably for men, maybe 9 to 15% is probably a good body fat percentage for building muscle. And for women, it's probably... And probably 20 to maybe 27% or something like that. I think for women, when you start to go below 20% and the leaner you get, then you start to see some kind of negative effects on hormones. And with men, that can happen after going below 9% and then going above 15%. Remember, fat is also hormone sensitive and it can increase the, the, or the way that your body responds to estrogen. It can cause you know increased... Cytokines are inflammatory markers. Right, yeah. and Too much of it's not good. Not enough of it's not good. Exactly. So you know, nine to fifteen, and then and now, what determines if it's nine or fifteen? Well, genetics, probably, right? So like Adam and I tend to be more on the ectomorph side. Being leaner was easier for me than being heavy. So I'm like you, around ten, eleven percent. You know, it's probably a good body fat percentage on the high end, maybe fourteen percent. Justin might be a little higher. He's a little bit more on the endomorph side, right? Husky. So ro ro robust husky. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> so and but you gain <laughs> trying to come up with a good descriptor. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, think of it this way. If I nine percent for me, I could build really well. I husky bet for man. you, you probably wouldn't feel very good walking around at nine yeah, percent no, the same I'd way. Feel terrible. I'd feel like death. Right. <laughs> so th th there's a bit of a range here, but the key is not too low, not too high is probably best. So ultimately what does this mean? Healthy. Yeah. That's really what it boils down well, to. Well, and that's why the yeah, answer that I gave range, is yeah. that we in let we need to get you in a healthy place metabolism wise before I'm even concerned about building muscle or burning fat. Right. So regardless of what body fat percentage you're at, uh in, in the range you gave, I think is a very fair generic range that yeah. I think is true. Uh but just because you're outside of that range doesn't necessarily mean I, I would want you to cut first, if depending on what Justin was talking about, your calorie intake. Right. If you are a 220 pound man and you're only eating 2,000 calories. Yeah, I don't care what uh, body fat percentage. Exactly, you're at. we're gonna try and get that to speed yeah, up. Yeah, you could be you could be 40 percent body fat, and I don't want technically to cut you right away. I right. want to address your metabolism first, which would mean we're gonna be focused on building strength, building muscle, and slowly increasing calories before we decide to get you down into that optimal place that you were talking about. Next question is from Tax Free Mitt. What advice do you have for someone who tends to hop between training programs and diet plans? I get excited to start something new, but tend to quickly get fixated on what I, on what I want to do next. Yeah, you're, you're falling in love with the the feeling of excitement and motivation. Novelty. Yeah. yeah, the entertainment and, of it. Yeah, and and no, here's the deal. I understand. Okay, when I feel motivated um, and excited, it's one of my favorite feelings. Like nothing's hard. Everything's easy. I got all the energy in the world to do all the stuff that I need to do. I've never had to, you know, get a really convince a client to work out when they were motivated. It just happened. I've never had to convince a client to eat right when they were motivated. It was when that feeling 
went away that we start to see some of the challenges. So the problem here with the person ask, uh, asking this question is you're so in love with the excitement and motivation that when that fades, well, that's it. What do I do next? Because now that's gone. It, in my training career, what this usually looked like was a person that would sign up for a marathon and then a triathlon and then uh, obstacle course race. And then it's like they always had to sign up for something in order to keep themselves you know, working out. And it, that was just a losing strategy at some point. So what you need to do is develop the skill of discipline and consistency and trust the process. Now, what does that mean? That means that when you follow a program, let's say you follow MAPS Anabolic, right? It, MAPS Anabolic is broken down into three phases. I can guarantee you that almost everybody who follows MAPS Anabolic is going to like one of the phases over the others. Mm -hmm. Okay, It's just the way it is. Like, I love phase one. I like the heavy training. I like the low reps, right? Phase three with the supersets and the faster pace, like that's my least favorite. But if I follow the program, I go all the way through. I trust the process because I know the value that it'll provide. And ultimately, gives me much better results doing that. So, I mean, I have a little challenge to that. Um, you necessarily don't have to. You could still continue to do this way. But it really is the difference between exercising and training. Uh, if you are going to the gym and you're bouncing from routine to routine and you're trying different stuff out all the time and you seek this novelty every time you go to the gym and you need that for motivation to get you in the gym and exercise, uh, then fine. And if you're content with where your physique is at, where your strength is at, there's nothing wrong with you exercising mm -hmm. like this, uh, if, you know. But if you have goals in mind and you're trying to uh, improve strength, you're trying to build muscle, you're trying to change your body composition, uh, then you want to follow a, you know, a training routine. You want to mm -hmm. follow a program and you want to stick with it or else you are. You're just burning calories. You're just burning calories, stimulating muscle. Yeah, I guess with better no, than nothing. Right, with no rhyme or reason. And there's and again, the, if this person is in a place where they are content with their performance, their health, their strength, their aesthetics, if they're happy with all that, then it's actually not that big of a deal. If this is if this is what gets you, if trying a new program out every fucking week is what gets you to go to the gym, then right. by all means, does it? But you have to understand that you're not being the most effective by doing that. And you that, know what right? the problem well, is, is that they don't tend to. What this tends to lead to, in my experience, is not every week I'm trying something different. It's I try something different, try something different, try something different. Nothing excites me. I stop. Yeah. And it's on off on off. It rarely looks like something new every single week. Usually it starts that way and then it becomes like nothing is sparking this in me and now I'm going to stop completely. Yeah, and so I guess sort of like to, to both your your ideas, like it's obviously very important for you to be specific at, at what you're doing in terms of training towards a goal. And so if, if that's in mind and that's sort of your cornerstone that you come back to, you know, there's there's plenty of room for you to interrupt that with, you know, novelty and, and, and adding in like a new Good type point. of a program to be entertained by and uh, just keep it fresh and keep it going. And this is something that I do occasionally. Uh, and this is why I got into like unconventional tools or methods or learning something uh, that I could then adopt and then incorporate into my meat and potatoes program. So it's not so stale. But at the same time, this is what's moving the needle. And so for me, like I have to learn how to just be disciplined to come back to that continuously if this is where I want to take, you know, my progress and where I want to take my body. So, yeah, to Adam's point of just exercising, yeah, there is room for that. If you're talking just longevity and staying healthy and, uh, you know, enjoying just the overall activity of movement. Uh, but being specific and having goals and, and trying to get somewhere, you really do need to narrow it down. Well, that's how I would, ex if this was a client of mine and they came to me with this problem, that would be my follow-up question. Yeah. Well, do you want to change anything about your body? Are you happy where your strength is? Are you happy where your body fat percentage is? Are you happy where your performance and strength is? And they said, yeah, I just like to, I'd be like, cool, keep doing your thing. It's not a big deal. But if you go, well, I would like to lean out a little bit more and I would like to be a little stronger or I would like to work on my shoulder. Oh, okay, well, then we need to train. <laughs> yeah. And then one of the things that, and this is where like tracking, I think, mm -hmm. uh, has its advantages is, you know, when I when I am when I'm trying to train and I'm really trying to achieve a goal, uh, I I will focus in on like specific exercises in my program. So let's say you're following Maps Anabolic, you know, I'll pick like my squat or my overhead press. I'll pick a couple movements, and I'm tracking them, and I want to see week over week uh, progression. 
And I'm tr- and, and so that is what that that'll keep me excited about the next week. Like, oh man, this week I put five more pounds on the bar with my push press, or my form got even better, or my range of motion was even better on my squat. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll uh, hyper focus on a couple movements within the program that will keep me excited about coming back to that exercise in the following weeks. If you have trouble sticking to a training routine and you know that's what you need to yeah. do, well, I think another good mentality with that is as you're going through your program, like you're no noticing where the weaknesses lie and where you know the 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 areas you could address to improve in, in terms of like seeking out another type of a program instead of going towards something that draws you in based on entertainment or something that you really enjoy like try and focus it a little bit more on maybe what's really difficult for you uh you know to to kind of like change your mindset around that in order to improve the overall yeah and again this is all assuming that this person's always consistent uh, and again yeah. in my experience this particular type of person isn't consistent uh, long term. They, they they're consistent because they're doing all this variety, yes, and at true. some point they just stop. So yeah, if they were always consistent, coming up with something new all the time, I guess that's better than nothing. But again, I, I it, in my experience, that tends to not be the case. Next question is from Big Turk AZ. What's your take on intra workout food and drinks? What are the benefits to incorporating them, and what are some good options? So overrated. Yeah, you know, you know, we're intra. So intra workout food or drinks would be like those gel cubes that you'll see runners eating, or a carbohydrate drink, or supplement companies love you. Yeah. Yes, yes, they do. Now, if you're doing, look, here's the deal: studies will show there's value in them. But it's really specific, like long, that, grueling yes. workouts. If I was – listen, I if you're the average person who's trying to change body composition, which I would say is 80 to 90% of the people listening to the podcast. And you're working out for Waste of time, yeah. gives a shit about it. If you're a Spartan racer, ultra marathon runner, tremendous value. Because yeah. at you know, mile 17 or something, you're going to be completely – you're going to hit a wall mm-hmm. if you don't refuel during that process. But the it is it's become uh, so grossly uh, populated or overpopulated in the uh, bodybuilding community that I used to just laugh about it. It was yeah. like the most comical thing I would see with my peers carrying around these bags and having to stop like midway to shove a bar in their mouth or drink their blue hyper blue colored drink real quick. And it was just like, <laughs> really? Come no, on. It's 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 if you have if you're gonna work out for like two hours or more and it's grueling and it's hard. You may have some value uh, in doing this. Otherwise, not really. I, I tell you what, if you want to drink something during your workout that might actually make a difference, it's not carbohydrates and protein. It's electrolytes, sodium, for example. Mm-hmm. That actually will make a difference <clears throat> within the next 10 minutes. Um, carbohydrates, not really. If, you're, if I've got plenty of stored glycogen and I'm not going to burn it in the hour workout that I'm going to do, which is probably... I'm probably not going to burn it unless I'm really, really super low calorie or whatever. It's got to take the most intense workout to, to burn all your yeah. glycogen stores. No, it's not going to do anything for you, and it's a, it's a total waste of time. If I'm doing a long ass, which I never do, I never do, I've, I never do workouts that are more than an well, hour. Well, that's a, half. a good point because that's the only. There was a, t- a point where when I was training for the show, where um, I did get to where sometimes I'd stay at the gym for three hours, but I would break it up with feedings. There you go. So I would train for an hour. Uh, pretty intensely. Then I take a break, have some, get some food in me, drink some liquid, liquid calories, relax a little bit, maybe walk the treadmill for twenty minutes of that. Then boom, get back and do some more work in the gym. Like, but that is like you're talking about the, like the highest level of yeah. training. Like I'm, I'm, this is me at the professional level of trying to maintain this physique. Yeah, if you're, like, if you're playing a game, if you're playing a basketball game, which can last quite a bit, or a football game, then it starts to make sense. But your to- normal, normal workouts, not really. It really doesn't make. That big of a difference, kind of waste of uh, of time, unless again you're doing these super long workouts. But if you want to drink something in your workout, try electrolytes. That yeah. that might make a difference, especially if you're low carb or you don't eat a lot of processed foods. I would say before and then during, uh, LMNT is uh, yeah. something that it's hot know, and humid, and you know you're you're losing. It's uh, a good example. Yeah, yeah. So you're sweating profusely. You know that would be but a good. Option. There there is exceptions to the rule here. I know I'm coming out and just like probably hammering a ton of people that are that are probably carrying their jugs around as they're listening to this right now. So I'm <laughs> not trying to offend everybody, but it's it's just one of those things that you know when I when I got into that space and I saw how popular it was, and I'd get clients, and that's like they that were competing, and they'd ask me like, "It's the marketing. It's brilliant. yeah." They're like, "Oh." I I'm like, no, don't even worry about so that. There's so many other the things that are Think about way more important. It's brilliant marketing because a supplement company knows that if you work out, the one thing that you do consistently is work out. 
And one of the most effective ways to get your product consumed consistently is to tie it to something that someone does anyways. You ritualize it, right? So every morning when you wake up or right before bed or your workout. So what do they come up with? At first, it was post-workout shake. That's the first time that they ever you know, really tied it to workouts. And it was brilliant. It sold more protein powder, by the way. Selling it as a post-workout uh, you know, supplement sold more protein powder than anything else anybody had ever done with protein powder. And then they got smart and said, why don't we sell a pre-workout supplement? And it exploded. Well, what about during the workout? So now you have pre-workout, intro-workout. <laughs> they hit it all now. There's just if, And if they could come up with a reason to do quarter halfway through, three quarters of the way, they would. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Front half right workout. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Back half but workout. Before you do There's these exercises, yeah. do this fluid. Yeah. Leg day workout drink. Yeah. You know, arm day. Don't like, be yeah. surprised if they get some shit that comes like that. Someone yeah. will figure it out, you know? <laughs> Next question is from Yamasan. How to get over the fear of failing when wanting to become an entrepreneur? Oh Ooh. gosh, yeah. You know what? You got to you got to make you got to be okay <laughs> with failing. That's you actually right. have to make peace with it. Yeah, it's a true. It's a true. Look, I'll tell you guys. I'll tell failure reps. I'll tell a story to the audience that this this was one of the key moments when I knew that I had chosen to work with the right partners uh, with this particular business, Mind Pump. When we start, a lot of people don't know this. We've told this on older episodes, but when we started this podcast, we had a a fifth founder. So what we have now is myself, Doug, Adam, and Justin. It's four of us. There was a fifth early on. It's our good friend, Craig Caperso. And in the beginning, Craig had all the he had all the social media authority. He had all the audience. I mean, Adam had a small presence on Instagram, but really Craig had most of the audience. And so the way we were going to get our start was with Craig was a great way to introduce us to a certain amount of people so that we could grow. And we all knew this and he had other values, but this was, you know, a big thing. This was a big deal. And without that start, anybody who starts a business, especially through social media or new media knows how hard it could be to get that initial foothold. So that's how we started. Well, anyway, we recorded like 15 episodes. We had put in a lot of work. This was early on. So for us, this was a big deal. Like now we can record a podcast, no big deal. But back then it was like, we all had jobs. We had to meet together at night. We'd record three episodes in a row and we, you know, we weren't good at it. So it was a big deal. So we did like 15 episodes, like months of work that we put together and we're ready to launch this thing. And Craig last minute, one of his sponsors listened to some of the episodes and early on we were pretty, you know, rough and, and a bit raw. And they said, yeah, I don't, I, I don't think you should be associated with this. It's a little controversial. And so he told us last minute, sorry guys, we can't release the episodes. I don't want to do it. And this was like a crushing blow. Imagine our foothold, our initial introduction was going to be this person with the social media following. The rest of us combined had like nothing, almost nothing. So it's like, what are we going to do? And I remember specifically I was okay with that. Fine. We're going to move forward anyway. And I literally thought I was going to have to get on the phone and motivate my other partners. I was prepared to get on the phone and do a speech and be like, that's it, guys. We're gonna... Before I could open my mouth, everybody else started their own speech about why we're going to do this anyway. And that's when I realized I was working with the right people. And what did it boil down to? We all had made, we'd all made peace with the, with failing. Like we, okay, if we fail, so what? We're going to try anyway. So that's the key. The key isn't to ensure that you won't fail. That's part of it. The key is to be okay with the fact that you're going to fail. And guess what? You probably will the first few times yeah, that you, you try. Much count on it. And you got to be. It's like it's like not being okay getting punched in the face if you're going to get in a boxing match. Right. That's impossible. You have to be okay with getting punched in the face because that's part of boxing and part of business is failing. So you got to be okay with it. Your uh, uh, Patrick Bet David has a, a really good book uh, called Your Next Five Moves. I really like it, and he's using the metaphor around um, uh, what do they call grandmasters, the the uh, chess players, chess player. oh, the yeah. grandmasters, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what they call them or whatever. And I and I think it's uh, I think that some of the the greatest in the world can see like twenty something plays ahead, which mm -hmm. is crazy to think about that because seeing twenty plays ahead means that you're not only thinking about their possible move, but the move that you will do in response to that move. And then- Bro, what it's if insane. They, yeah, that's, so it's crazy. That's What's what, that series on Netflix? Uh, Queen's Gambit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they kind of show that a Yeah, bit. and so it, it just, it highlights the, the brilliance of, of being able to do that. Now his book is called The Next Five Moves because he's talking about, he, he relates that to business and why that's so important to be able to, many people can't see five moves later. 
and it's so important. And part, and so it, to piggyback off of what you're saying is part of what making peace with failing isn't just being like, okay, I'm okay with failing. Because sometimes people hear that and they're like, okay, well, that's it. You just yeah. just decide it's okay to yeah, fail. I tried, and I guess not. Yeah, can go that's away. The, yeah. that's that's only that's only one part of it. The, the part of making peace with failing is accepting what does it look like if we fail, and then what your next move is in mm -hmm. response to that failing. And then let's say you do that move, and then that one fails. What's your next response to that? And say you do that move, and that one fails, and then what's your next response yeah. to that? Mm -hmm. So you're able to see four or five moves out that all could possibly go the opposite way of what you want them to and how would you respond in that situation and so and then you make peace with that that okay here's what i want to do now there's a good chance x y and z might happen if that happens then what is the next move for me to do okay well then i'm going to do this okay let's say i do that then what happens when that fails? Okay, well the, and if you can see out five moves and four of those moves basically being failure, there's a very good chance that you're going to get it by the fifth time yeah. and it's going to work itself out. And really, uh, a lot of the success, that we, I mean, before I even met uh, these guys or we decided to do Mind Pump, I had this kind of vision around uh, building a business. In fact, I had another partner, Paulo, who was going to be the guy who wrote because we all know that I can't write, right? So he was... The, the he was the the silver tongue kind of what I'd say Sal is in in our group now and has the ability to write really well and I had this vision of you know writing these blogs that had all this value and then I'd get advertisers so I had this vision for a business that uh, is nothing what we're doing now but it's mold what we are done now is molded kind of from that idea mm -hmm. and a lot of the things that we all thought we would be doing when we first started this. Is, does not look exactly the same way when we all sat mm -hmm. in that room the first time. We just, we had an idea, we had a vision, we knew that we could add tremendous value and we weren't afraid if that, that way didn't work because then we would do this. And if that didn't work out, then we would do that. And everybody was excited about attempting to do that and not afraid of the potential failure. Well, a couple things, you know, to kind of, you know, piggyback off of that. Um, like most of it, uh, you know, in, in the time of, of doing all this is it, you realize that I started to turn those failures and the language of failure into education. And, and we've talked about this as being somewhat of an expensive education that you, you learn through all of this. I'm taking, you know, this potential failure. I'm, I'm thinking about my next move, but what did I learn from that? Like, what are all those lessons within that, that now I can apply going forward and change and adjust. So I don't make, I don't repeat, uh, you know, those same mistakes. Uh, the other part of it is like, as you have this grand vision for where you want to go and uh, where you want to take, uh, whatever idea or whatever it is that you want to do with it, you have to understand it's not going to be the same thing. Yeah. And, and to really just, just, uh, you know, be comfortable with that, be flexible with that and know that the only way for it to keep moving forward is to, to, you know, sort of flow with it and, and to be able to be open to changing, adjusting and uh, getting the feedback and, 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 you know, moving and altering from those potential failures, or you get so many of those in front of you, they become reps. So you can anticipate your moves, you know, extend out further. So now you anticipate those failures and you adjust before they happen. Well, yeah. that's the real silver lining in, in the failure thing. I remember when I was like 20, I read this article that said that like the average billionaire uh, failed like nine times before they were successful. The 10th time was the success. And I remember reading that article and like my instant motivation from that was I needed to hurry up and go fail 10 times. Yeah. That was like, it was like, oh my God, like how many people I'm, stop after the fifth one? Right. Think about that one. You know, and so, and I remember thinking that like, man, if that's the average billionaire and I, and at that point in my life, I don't know if I had aspirations to really truly be a billionaire, but of course I was going to shoot for the stars, land on the moon type of deal. Right. So it was like, okay, if this is what billionaires have to do to become successful. And here I am at 20 years old, I've only attempted maybe one or two businesses by that time. I'm going, oh my God, well, I just got to keep trying these things that I believe in. And I need to get to that 10 because hopefully by the time I, on my way to 10, hopefully I'll land one of them. Yeah. And maybe if that's the average billionaire who's way smarter than me, maybe I'll have to do 20. So in my mind, I'm going to try and get to 20 failures and hopefully along the way of 20 failures, I'm going to learn all these lessons that you're talking about and I'll be able to piece something together where I'll find success. Yeah. I think, you know, a big part of it too is just self-belief, like knowing that no matter what happens, you're going to figure it out. Like, I know I'm going to be yeah. okay. No matter what happens to whatever I'm doing, no matter how bad it fails, 
I'm going to be able to figure out a way to take care of myself and my family, get back on my feet, and then try again. Now, imagine the confidence when you work with partners that feel that same way, right? Like, I know no, something happens. We'll figure it out, and we'll we'll take the next steps that are necessary. And that's that's part, for me at least, that's part of what makes me not afraid of failing because if something fails, I have self-belief knowing that, well, if that doesn't work, I know I can do something else. I'm not going to be frozen and screwed totally or completely. I mean, I had a client that one time I, I asked him that question. I was eight, I was young. I was 18 or 19. And I asked him, what's the, one, what's the one piece of advice that you could give me, you know, for success? And he goes, you know, you're asking me the wrong thing. And I said, what? And he goes, ask me how many times I've failed. I said, well, okay. And by this time, this guy was a self-made millionaire. He came from nothing, like high school dropout, like long story. And so I said, all right, well, how many times have you failed? He goes, Sal, I've gone bankrupt several times. And he explains each of the times he's gone bankrupt trying to build a business. And he said, you know, it's you just got to swing the bat. You're going to miss, but then you'll hit. And then you'll hit a home run. So you have to believe in yourself and know that at some point it's going to work out for you. And it's you. It's more often than not, it's true. And even if you don't hit that big home run, you're probably you're probably better off than it had you not tried. Oh, you're you're definitely better off, especially if you learn to reframe failures as growth opportunities, because that's where growth happens. Mm -hmm. Growth does not happen in success. When you succeed at something, it's, it's you not really comfortable. learn a lot if it's right away. That's right. You, it's it's the failures were the, so. If you can become a person who is for, and I think you, Sal, alluded to this first was that you know, being growth minded, if you are pursuing growth ultimately over all things. So maybe I have this business idea of mind pump I want to do, but ultimately I want to just continue growing as a human is my main goal. Like that's, what's great is that even in, within a failure towards yeah. mind pump, I still s succeed at growing mm -hmm. because that failure is where growth happens. So if you can reframe the way you look at failures, you get more comfortable in that place. You know, it's funny too about that. And I guarantee you guys the same way, because we've been doing stuff like this for a long time. If you look back at momentary failures, I bet you can look back and say, gosh, I'm, I'm so happy that happened. Of course. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that that situation, we've had them within our own business where mm -hmm. we've had, we've worked with people and then had to not work with people. And it always has turned into something better later on. But I couldn't imagine if we got frozen in the, in the failure of it, uh, how we would have never reaped the benefits that could occur from, you know, failure like that. So that's a big one. It's not easy, by the way. I know it sounds like we're making it sound like it's super easy. It's not even easy for us, uh, you know, talking about it's easy, but it's still a challenge. Nobody likes to fail. I'm going to be honest with you. It's not like I'm sitting here saying, no, it's failing's <laughs> awesome. I have way more fun winning. It, yeah, it sucks. Fun to win. And it's hard. This is all hindsight. But do I fear failing? I don't like it. I don't fear it. It's a big difference between yep. the two. Look, if you want to, if you like our information, you want more great information that's free from Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on social media. So, Instagram, that's the social media platform we're usually on. And Justin can be found at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam is at Mind Pump Adam.